the middle paragraph on the page, page 27, describes who the Jewish people are in terms of their ancestry. It says, we are your people, members of your covenant, children of Abraham, your beloved, to whom you took an oath, Mount Maria, the offspring of Isaac, his only son, who was bound atop the altar, community of Jacob, your firstborn son. You can stop there. Now let's analyze this. We are children of Abraham, your beloved. Whose beloved? Who's the you? God. Your translator gives it away because he capitalizes your, right? And it's true. So Abraham here is related to God. Abraham, God's beloved. We're speaking in second person, but it's Abraham, God's beloved. Offspring of Isaac, next line. His only son. Who's the he? Abraham. Abraham's only son. That's the way God describes Isaac to Abraham. You are only one. Here, it's his only son. It means relating Isaac to Abraham. Next line, community of Jacob. Your firstborn son, who's the you? God again. So he has something very peculiar here. You have the three patriarchs. Abraham is related to God. Jacob is related to God. And in between, Isaac is related to Abraham. And uh, lest one think it's just happenstance, there happens to be another text of the Siddur, which a small minority of communities use, where for, Jake, for Isaac, instead of saying his only son, it says, your bound one with a capital Y, which would mean that Isaac is also being related to God. So there's an alternative text of the Siddur where all three are related to God, but our text doesn't do that. Our text relates Abraham to God, and Jacob to God, and Isaac not. Isaac related to Abraham. Hmm. That's not an accident. Something's being communicated here. When I discovered that, I thought, golly, I wonder what it means. Now, let's take a look at the blue books, and I'll show you a little bit that we can use as background. And then I'll tell you what I think is going on here. Now look at page 129. Top of the page, verse 2. Hashem appeared to him, him is Isaac, and said, Do not descend to Egypt. Dwell in the land that I shall indicate to you. Sojourn in this land, I will be with you and bless you. To you and your offspring will I give all these lands and establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will increase your offspring like the stars of the heavens. I will give your offspring all these lands. That's what I told Abraham. I'm telling you, Isaac, that you're going to get it. And all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by your offspring. A grand, lovely blessing. Because, God says, I'm giving all of this to you, Isaac, because Abraham obeyed my voice, observed my safeguards, my commandments, my decrees, and my Torahs. God is talking directly to Isaac, telling him, I'm giving you a blessing because of what Abraham did. That's why I'm giving you the blessing, because of what Abraham did. Look on page 133, top of the page, 24. Hashem appeared to him, that's Isaac, that night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bless you and increase your offspring because of Abraham, my servant. These are the only two places that God speaks to Isaac and gives him a blessing. Both times, he says, I'm giving you a blessing because of Abraham. That's atypical. I would say it's almost unique. Jacob gets a blessing from God on several occasions. Never does he say because of Abraham and Isaac. Never. 
Jacob blesses his children, Joseph and all of his children. He doesn't say because of Abraham and Isaac. That's Jacob talking. Um, Moses blesses the Jewish people. He doesn't say because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is really unique. That Isaac is getting a blessing because of Abraham. We seem to be getting a message that Isaac doesn't stand alone. Isaac doesn't stand alone. He gets in only, somehow, as an extension of Abraham. Abraham's an original. He gets what he gets alone. Jacob, who's later, gets what he gets on his own. Isaac not. And that has to be explained. It looks like the sitter is copying that distinction by relating Isaac only to Abraham. Whereas Abraham and Jacob are both related to God, Isaac's related to Abraham and not related to God. Now, this explanation is based on principles that I have explained to some of you uh, a number of times. Abraham's essence, his philosophical expression is loving kindness. Isaac's essence is strict justice. Those two principles are not equal. They're not equally fundamental. The purpose of all creation is loving kindness. That is the sole purpose of the whole creation. Yes, God does relate to us out of justice from time to time. He does so only as an application of loving kindness. It does not stand on its own. The only thing that can stand on its own is loving kindness. So, if Abraham represents loving kindness, he relates to God directly. If Isaac expresses strict justice, he can't relate to God directly. He can't, because strict justice has no independent existence. It has no independent application. So Isaac is being told, you exist only as an expression of Abraham. You can't exist on your own. Abraham can exist on his own, but you cannot. The blessings are blessings for him as the patriarch of the Jewish people. It means the blessings that he gets are going to flow through him, down through history to the Jewish people. They can't come directly from God because God has no direct application of, of justice. God's application of justice is only through loving kindness. Therefore, Isaac can only exist as an extension of Abraham. Jacob? Jacob is some kind of amalgam of loving kindness and justice. He has roots in both. Since he has roots in both, he has access to a direct relationship with God because of his possession of loving kindness. So he too, as it is in the sitter, can be related to God directly. He too can receive, as it is in the Chumash, blessings from God without mention of Abraham and Isaac behind him as the ones to whom, from whom the blessing comes or through whom the blessing comes. Only Isaac can, can be that way. Are we together so far? Okay, next Monday is what holiday? Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. What's the theme of Rosh Hashanah? Judgment. 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 So whose day is it? It's Isaac's day. Rosh Hashanah is Isaac's day. Do you know what we read, what portions of the Torah we read on the two days of Rosh Hashanah? Okay, one is the arcade of the binding of Isaac, where Abraham takes Isaac and binds him and puts him on an altar under a charge from God to slaughter him. That's how they got the strict justice from. Well, now, who's in control here? If Isaac is strict justice, he's being, he's being set up as a sacrifice performed by, by Abraham. That, if it expresses anything, it expresses loving kindness so overwhelmingly powerful that it leaves no place for strict justice at all. Strict justice has to be simply smothered. That's one. What do we read on the other day? The birth of Isaac. The birth of Isaac. Isaac being born through Abraham. That's a direct statement of dependence. You are Abraham's son. That's what you are. Both of them express the idea that strict justice is dependent on Abraham. One is dependent for its existence, where the sacrifice is repealed at the last moment, and the other is dependent for its existence and dependent for its continued existence, its viability, and the other is dependent upon Abraham for its existence because he's born from Abraham. The two readings 
on Rosh Hashanah express this idea directly. So which one do we read first? Do we read the binding of Isaac first, and then we read the birth of Isaac, or is it the other way around? It's good that you ask. I have, I have to check. I don't remember. The first day is the birth, and the second day is the, is the binding. Okay. So it's good. It's good. It's in chronological order. Okay. That's very good. So where he comes from, and, and that means, uh, since you asked, let's just push it a little bit. Um, the idea of two days has a long and complicated history. In the city of Jerusalem, where the first of the month could be declared, very often there was only one day. Two days is only because outside of Jerusalem they didn't know whether the first day was declared as the first day or was the later day. Because at the beginning of the month, the month was sanctified on the basis of sightings of the new moon. And sometimes it was sighted, sometimes it wasn't sighted. So everywhere else we knew it could be Monday or Tuesday. In Jerusalem, they often knew that it was Monday. Since they knew it was Monday, it was only one day. There wasn't a second day. So then if there's any, any reading that would be relevant, it would be the birth of Isaac, not the, not the second. Good. Okay, so that's what you can get from paying careful attention to the blessings that are, uh, that are made here. Now I want to show you something entirely different. Take a look at page 297. Before we go into detailed analysis, I want to give you the scenario and make a couple of remarks about the general, the general form of, the, of, the, of these uh, the events. Chapter 2. A man went from the house of Levi and he took a daughter of Levi. Got married. The woman conceived and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was good. And he hid him for three months. She could not hide him any longer. So she took him from a wicker basket, smeared it with clay and pitch, placed the child into it, and put him among the reeds at the bank of the river. His sister stationed herself at a distance to know what would be done with him. There's no break in. The paragraph breaks in the English are just because the editors think that your attention span is about 35 seconds and you can't handle a long paragraph. In the Hebrew, it's all one block of text. So don't read anything into the fact that the paragraph ends here or there. Pharaoh's daughter went down to bathe by the river, and her maidens walked along the river. She saw the basket among the reeds. She sent her maidservant, and she took it. She opened it, and she saw him, the child, and behold, the youth was crying. She had pity upon him and said, this is one of the Hebrew boys. His sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and summon for you a wet nurse from the Hebrew women who will nurse the boy for you? The daughter of Pharaoh said, go. The girl went and summoned the boy's mother, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this boy and nurse him for me, and I'll give your pay. So the woman took the boy and nursed him. The boy grew up. She brought him to the daughter of Pharaoh, and he was a son to her. She called his name Moses, as she said, For I drew him from the water. Let's stop there. Now, I don't expect you to know this because you're not familiar with biblical style, but this is utterly unique. We're reading about the birth of the one of the greatest Jewish heroes. It doesn't go like that in this book. In this book, you know who his father is and who his mother is and who their ancestors were. You place him in a genealogy. This is utterly anonymous. A man from the tribe of Levi took a daughter of Levi and conceived, and there are no names here, nothing. And the truth is, a few chapters later, the genealogy of Moses is traced in all detail, and we know who his father was, we know who his mother was, we have the whole genealogy. But this is his first introduction, and it's utterly anonymous. Nowhere do you have something like that. In the entire Tanakh, you don't have something like that. Can you imagine what the message might be? Moses is one of the greatest people who ever lived. How did he get to be that way? Say again? Okay, but I mean, the general picture is if you introduce him in terms of his august lineage, the reader will naturally say, sure, he was great. Look who his parents were. Look who his grandparents were. He comes from you know, great lineage of people. And of course, he, was, he, he turned out to be great. John Stuart Mill, one of the great 19th, 20th century philosophers, his parents were both outstanding intellectuals of the previous generation. And they paid for private schooling for him at home. Is it surprised he turned out to be a, 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 an outstanding intellectual? He, he had all the materials put on the, on the table for him. The Torah doesn't want you to think that way about Moses. 
doesn't want you to think that way. Yes, he had great parents, but they don't explain his greatness. His greatness was his own achievement. That's why it introduces him anonymously. That's point number one. Are we together so far? Point number two, using your contemporary political sensitivities, what do you see on this page? What consistent feature is there in the entire story on this page about Moses' background? Jewish. Yeah. What else? He's a Levite. He's a Levite. Okay. What else? Okay. We'll see about the banditti. Okay. But that, that, I'm talking about on, on the whole page. There's a certain consistency on the whole page, which, given contemporary political sensitivities, ought to be really striking. But the whole page. Keep keep. That's the right direction. Keep. It's all. It's all women. It's all women. There's one man there. His father, his job is to make the brother, mother conceive. That's it. He's finished. It's the mother and the sister and the daughter of Pharaoh. He's rooted in a feminine context. Now, as knowing as much of the, of the Tanakh as I know, it's undeniable that that's being said here. Why it's being said, I don't know. I've asked a number of people. I've looked in commentaries. I haven't found anything. But there's no question and he's being rooted in a feminine, to the extent that it's his mother and, and the daughter of Pharaoh who save his life. The daughter of Pharaoh gives him his name. Do you think he had a Jewish name? Yes! The Talmud records what his Jewish name was. Nobody knows that. Even black hatters typically don't know it. We know him by the name that the daughter of Pharaoh gave him. Names are very important. Names express essences. And here it's the daughter of Pharaoh who gives him this name by which he's known to billions of people. But that's quite striking. The, the, the being rooted in the feminine here is, is absolutely striking. Okay, we're together so far? Now let's look at some details. Um, just glance at the very top of the page. Pharaoh commanded his entire people saying, every son that will be born into the river you shall throw him. And every daughter you shall keep alive. Obviously, there was a period in which the Egyptians were afraid that a savior for the Jewish people was going to be born. And they were looking for a way to protect themselves. They knew the savior would be male. That much in the ancient world they knew. Uh, so they said, Pharaoh they made a decree. And it's in his words, and some commentators take it this way, he meant even Egyptian uh, boys, not just Jewish boys. And if you say it's a Jewish boy, it doesn't matter. It means that every Jewish woman who's pregnant knows she gives birth to a son, she's going to be in trouble. Okay, now, the Midrash fills in a little bit of background information. This is one of the stories where if you don't have the background information, it's hard to make the story work. It means that when the story was written, it was written in a context in which people knew about this background. The Pharaoh said, male babies, newborn male babies have to be killed. There were spies or overseers, Egyptians, who took account of Jewish women when they appeared to be pregnant, which is usually around three months, they put it on a date. This one's pregnant at this date, go back in six months and check. She's pregnant, she's going to give birth in about six months, go back and check. Find the baby, make sure whether it's a boy or a girl, and if it's a boy, make sure to kill it. That was true for Moses' mother also. But she gave birth early, about three months early. He was a preemie. Okay? Now, what does the text say? The woman conceived, gave birth to a son. She saw that he was good. He didn't cry. If he cries, it makes no difference. They'll hear it and they'll come checking. No, but he didn't cry. And she hid him for three months. Why three months? Because after three months, the overseers are going to come and check. They're going to find out. You, were, you showed uh, signs of being pregnant. Six months ago, it's the end of nine months. Where's the baby? She gave birth at six months, so she knows I got three months grace. Well, they're not going to come, but after three months, I'm going to be in trouble. So she hid him for three months because he didn't cry. There are such babies. Our oldest, when he was born, did nothing but eat and sleep. He was very, he was just like out of it. <laughs> it was no problem at all. She couldn't hide him any longer. So she put him in a basket and put him next to the river. What can she do? She's doing the best she can. 
if they come to her house and, and ask for him, he's going to be dead anyhow. She puts him there and leaves it up to God's will to, to determine what will happen. Then the incident with Pharaoh's daughter comes by and think of the irony. Moses' sister stations herself to see what's going to happen. Pharaoh's daughter takes, she takes pity on him and, and uh, uh, Miriam, the, the sister, says to uh, Pharaoh's daughter, would you like me to get a wet nurse for your, for your newfound baby? I mean, you can't nurse him, right? You didn't have a baby. She says, sure, that's a great idea. Right? She goes and brings the boy's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter says, I'll pay you. You, are, you, are, you, are, you have milk? I'll pay you to nurse. Well, it turns out to be her own son. Right? That's, how, it, that's how, it, uh, how, how she saves it. Then when the nursing period is over, which in those days was two to three years, no Similac, right? not even cow's milk, two to three years, then she brings him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he acts as a son to her. So the alert critic says, why didn't Pharaoh notice this? All of a sudden, his daughter has this unknown child? Uh, Pharaoh probably had 100 wives, 200 wives. He was an emperor, and harems were all the rage in those days. How many children did he have? Hundreds and hundreds of children. One of those children uh, ends up having a little boy. He's not keeping track of hundreds and hundreds of children and thousands of, of grandchildren. It's just not in his style. So it's easy to understand how this could, uh, could happen. And besides, he picks up a three-year-old child. It's not going to. Now, I stress the three-year-old because that means there was plenty of time for his parents to talk to him, to explain to him when you'll have a child even a three-year-old, you'll see that you can explain a great deal to them. Our oldest was in the back seat of the car, and uh, he said to me, two and a half years old, does God have a body? I said, no. So he said, then how can he talk? Two and a half years old. I said, well, God makes the world, and he can make things. He can make tables, he can make people, he can make stars, and he can make sounds also. Silence from the back seat. I said, you understand? And he said, no, if he doesn't have a body, he can't talk. <laughs> Two and a half years old, right? So you get a kid going up to three, and okay, my kid's very smart, you know, he's our kid. But Moses? So you can explain a lot to him before he goes back to the palace. Now you have this kid with a hybrid upbringing. Three years with his parents, knowing that he's a Jew, a Levite, as was pointed out, and now being raised in the palace. How does he end up? What consciousness does he have? What identity does he have? Take a look at the next page. It happened in those days that Moses grew up and went out to his brethren and observed their burdens. He saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his brethren. Now, this is a very clipped, elliptical text. It doesn't elaborate. That's not poetical in that way. It says, of his brethren, twice in one sentence. Who is Moses? He's a Jew. The oppressed Jews are his brothers. That's how he understands them. That's how he relates to them. And, in fact, in the Hebrew, when it says, observe their burdens, the phraseology in the Hebrew is not he saw, but he empathized. It's liros, be, bayar, be, sivlosan. Not es sivlosan which would be neutral. He saw their suffering. No, he, Liroz Be means to empathize with their, with their suffering. So this gives you a clear picture of the identity that he, that he achieved, starting with the three years in his, in his parents' house. Those three years gave him that identity. He turned this way and that, saw there was no man, so he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. This is incident number one. There's no man. No, no observers. Oh, so there's no watcher. Like. Yeah, correct. Although you're right, the, the, the oral tradition adds extra content because that phraseology is used. I'm not going to point it out now, but you're right to point it out. It could have just said no one. It says there's no man. Where is ish? That's a special word. At any rate, that's incident number one. What I'll do is throw you, show you three incidents, and then we'll meditate on the relationship between them. That's incident number one. 
Is it number two? He went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. He said to the wicked one, Why would you strike your fellow? He replied, Who appointed you as a dignitary, a ruler, a judge over us? Do you propose to murder me as you murdered the Egyptian? So even though Moses did not notice any observers when he struck the Egyptian, somehow word got out. Whether it was the victim whose life he saved who told other people, or there was an unobserved, uh, unknown observer, or whatever it is, by the next day, people are talking about it. Pharaoh heard about it, heard about this matter, and sought to kill Moses. Son, stepson, makes no difference. You're violating this rule? That this group of people has to be a slave, and you did it by killing an Egyptian? <laughs> That's the end of you. And Moses fled before Pharaoh and settled the land of Midian, sat by a well. That's the end of the second incident. Now, by the way, just as a point of detail, look at 13. Carefully. He went out the next day, and behold, two he remember fighting. He said to the wicked one, Why would you... Strike your fellow. What is he observing? The person he's talking to, what is he observing about him? What is he doing, this guy he's talking to? He's judging. Why would you strike your fellow? What's it? Why would you say your fellow brother? Yeah, but what's the why would you strike? Just say, don't strike. Because you guys should be able to be... Has he hit him yet? They were fighting. Has he hit him yet? Who knows? Fighting could be there. Well, if so, then he should have said, why did you strike your fellow? He says, why would you strike your fellow? That means he's raised his hand to strike. And the Torah says he spoke to the wicked person, to the Russia, the evil person. That means threatening violence is already evil. Doesn't require carrying it out. Threatening violence already qualifies a person for a title of being evil. That's one thing that we see here. At any rate, that's the second incident. Now let's look at the third incident. He, can, he ended up in Midian. The minister of Midian had seven daughters. We'll talk about minister in a little while. They came and drew water and filled with troughs to water their father's sheep. The shepherds came and drove them away. Moses got up and saved them and watered their sheep. Do you see a progression here? Three incidents. If you wanted to interpret Moses' motivation in a minimal fashion, I'm not saying this is correct, but if you wanted to do it, in the first incident, what would you say? An Egyptian man is striking a Jewish man, and Moses kills him. What does that express? Don't mess with my people. Don't mess with my people. You know, he's a Jew, I'm a Jew. Don't, don't mess. Do that, we're going to get you. We don't tolerate that. That's a sentiment worthy of the mafia. The mafiosa are also brothers. You touch one mafia guy, the mafia all over will chase you to, to the ends of the earth and kill you. Right? Second incident, two Jews are fighting. Two Jews are fighting. Moses intervenes, declares that one of them is wicked. What does this express? My people has to live up to standards. This is not just protecting my people against others. It's not just favoritism for my group. My group has to live up to certain standards, standards of justice. That's a step beyond killing the Egyptian who's beating a Jew. Now, the third incident, he's in Midian. He's a stranger. He's a nobody. And he says, these people are victims can't stand by and watch them be victimized. A person says, you know, I'm in Rome. Am I going to tell the Italians what to do? I'm a stranger here. No, not Moses. Wherever he is, if he sees something that's wrong and he can take a step to correct it, he takes a step to correct it. You see here a passion for justice across the board. Now, of course, we are not going to assume that his character changed from period to period. Once you see him saving the Midianite girls, so then you have to project it backwards and say that's what motivated him all the way through. What you have here is a picture of a person who's committed to justice and willing to put himself on the line, risk himself for the sake of justice. Now, that makes the following Midrash all the more impressive 
The Midrash asks, why was Moses chosen to be the leader of the Jewish people? And it ignores all three of these incidents and cites an incident which isn't written in the written Torah anywhere, that he was a shepherd, he became a shepherd for the, this, this mid, minister of Midian, and he had the sheep out in the wilderness, grazing, and one of them wandered off into the hills, he followed it, he found it, it had gone to a spring to drink water, and he said, if I had known that you were thirsty, I would have carried you here on my shoulders. Because of that incident, he became the leader of the Jewish people, which means, from our point of view, Leadership is not based on justice. Leadership is based on kindness and responsibility and care and giving, not on justice. It's another expression of the idea that I told you 15 minutes ago. That justice is not an independent principle. Loving kindness is an independent principle. To be the leader of a people, that's what has to motivate you. Yes, you may have to use justice from time to time. You may have to use it, but that can't be your ultimate motivation. Your ultimate motivation has to be kindness and responsibility giving, and care. Okay? Now, back to 16. The minister of Midian had seven daughters. They came and drew. Rashi quotes a rabbinic tradition that he was a former minister. A former minister. He had been a minister, but he isn't anymore. Anything in the verse indicate why Rashi is saying that? Father Sheep, he's a shepherd. It seems uh, that he was he's a shepherd now. Oh, that's nice. That's a nice, nice thought. I've never, no one has ever suggested that thought before. Because it says here that, he, um, that the minister of Mindan had seven daughters. They came and drew water and filled the throws of to water their father's sheep. Right, right. So it's a, you can assume, all right, that maybe he is retired or a shepherd now. I think that's a nice, it's a nice suggestion. You, one could squeeze out of it by saying he's a minister and he has private holdings, and uh, this is part of his private holdings and, and being consistent with the minister. But I, it's a nice thought. But now follow it out in the scenario, I think there's an even stronger indication, as, as almost a proof, that he couldn't be a contemporary minister. What happens to these daughters? They come and they draw water, and the local shepherds came and drove them away. Now you tell me, if he's a minister... Are local shepherds going to do that to the minister's daughters? Probably not. That's probably not safe. You know, it's probably not, not prudent to do that. If the local shepherds can, with impunity, uh, drive the daughters away, it's not, not plausible that he's now currently a minister in the government. Right? You try doing that to uh, you know, Secretary of State or, or the Secretary of Defense, you're probably not going to get very far. Right? So it means he had been a minister, now, I just want you to know, the word in the Hebrew here for minister is kohen. And that's an important piece of vocabulary. Kohen does not mean priest. Kohen means some kind of official with an official capacity. One such official is what we call a priest who does the service in the temple and so forth and so on. But the word kohen is much broader than that. So when you see the word kohen in our literature, you cannot assume that the person functions as a priest. Here, certainly wasn't the priest. Okay, Moses takes up residence, and the, the girls come home, and the father says, wow, you made it early today. How come you made it so early? And they say, this fellow helped us out, protected us from the shepherds. And the man says, come to bring him home, and they bring him home, and he marries one of the daughters. He stays there, and he, Moses, becomes a shepherd with the, uh, uh, with the, the flocks of his father-in-law. 301. Now we come to an extremely well-known incident, most of the Bernie Bush. I'm just going to introduce you to it today, and tomorrow we'll pick it up and, and we'll follow it through. Chapter 3. Moses was shepherding the sheep of Jethro, his father-in-law. The Now, I don't know why the English changes to priest here. I, I can't explain it. They should have said minister, same as they did on the previous page, the same word in Hebrew. He guided the sheep far into the wilderness. He arrived at the mountain of God toward Choreb. He didn't know that. We're being told that by the author of the text. An angel of God, those who've been here know better translations, agent of God, or angel for short, appeared to him in a blaze of fire from amid the bush. He saw, and behold, the bush was burning in the fire, but the bush was not consumed. Flames are dancing around it, but it's not being turned into ash and coals, just flames. Moses thought, 
I will turn aside now and look at this great sight. Why will the bush not be consumed? The English here is correct. Turn aside. Turn away. Hashem saw that he turned to see, and Hashem called out to him from amid the bush. Up to there. The Malbum of the great commentators asked two questions here. First of all, imagine you're walking down a road, and a glint of light catches your eye, and you think, oh, look at that. That bush is on fire. Nothing else is on fire. That bush is on fire. And you know what? I don't see any ash going up in the flames, sparks. I don't see any, any disintegrated wood there. That's very peculiar. No. I'm going to go take a look. Now, would you describe his movement as turning aside or turning to? Turning away from or turning to? How would you describe it? Turning to, obviously. The Hebrew uses the verb to turn away from. Lasur means to turn away from. Vayifen would mean he turned to. They're two separate verbs in Hebrew. And here it says he turned away from. That's very peculiar, says the Malbrun. And he's right. Definitely very peculiar. Secondly, the next verse says, Hashem saw that he turned aside to see. What? And that's sort of, that's the significant thing here. God's watching. He says, oh, look at that. He's turning. He's going to check. Oh, he's turning. He's going to check. I'm going to talk to him. Who wouldn't go and check? That's some kind of great accomplishment, great, unique uh, nobility or, 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 or uh, uniqueness that says, God says, oh, because of that, I'm going to talk to him. The Malbim gives an answer to both questions with the same explanation. Imagine observing that. There's, the bush is on fire, flames are burning there, and it's not being consumed. Everybody would be fascinated by that. Everybody would be interested and would want to check it. But each person would check it in his own way. An engineer would say, um, or a physicist would say, how can that be? Fire requires it's oxidation. It requires some kind of fuel. What's the fuel that's supporting the fire? An entrepreneur would say, free energy. I can get a grant to build an energy plant here. I can sell energy and make a gigantic profit. Uh, a tourist minister would say, we can advertise this all over the world. We'll set up an airport here. Everybody will come to see it. A poet would say, how would I describe this in words? An artist would say, how would I paint a picture of a bush on fire and show in the picture that is not being consumed? Everyone would look at it from his own point of view, what interests him, what his focus is in life. It would attract everyone, but in a different way. Moses said, this is not part of the physical world. Not part of the physical world. It shouldn't be interpreted as part of the physical world. He turned aside from all of those associations and said, something brand new is breaking into the world here. It's coming from somewhere else. And I have to investigate what it means and where it's coming from. And that's what God observed in him. What God observed in him is turning aside from all the natural associations to see in this something unique and different. And God said, aha, that's the way he's taking it. I'm going to talk to him because he's the only person I want to communicate with. So both are now turning aside is really in the English. So conceivably, it could have been, could have been noticed. But then to say that God's noticed he turned aside, Okay, first, first address, five. God says to him, Do not come closer to here. Remove your shoes from your feet. The place upon which you stand is holy ground. There's a double message here. It's a double message. Can anybody figure it out? He's been told two things. What is the connotation of the two things? One is told to you explicitly. I want you to infer for the other one. Do not come closer to here. Remove your shoes from your feet, for the place upon which you stand is holy ground. Um, can it be interpreted that he actually left the physical world and actually went into an in-between place between the spiritual world and our world? And Maybe. that's why he's saying, don't come any closer, for the ground that you stand on is holy. He's in a spiritual holy place. Don't come closer because you will then completely cross over. 
Okay, but now, okay, I, I think you have the point that I'm interested in. You're adding other material also. What's the difference between here and there? There's no physicality. What's the difference between where the bush is and where he's standing? It's holy ground. What is holy ground? Ground. Which ground? I said, what's the difference between two places? Okay. The place where the bush is and the place where he's standing. Those are two different places. What's the difference between those two places? The learning bush. No, but of their character, their status, their significance, their value, their meaning. It says the place upon which you stand is holy. The where you're standing is holy. Where you're standing is already holy. Uh, and you can't come close to the bush. Uh, In other words, the, the, without paying attention, one would say, oh, of course you can't come close to the bush. God's voice is going to speak out of it. An angel is there. That's holy. Of course you can't come there. Human being can't come to that holy place. Yeah, but the text says, where you're standing is also holy which means that you as a human being can inhabit holiness. Only there's something beyond that holiness that you can't approach. It's telling you where you are can be holy. But there's something above what's holy in this world. And that you have to, have to remain some, some level distant from it. It means ultimately we have to confront the idea that there can be a holiness in the world in which we stand, but there can also be something else that breaks in, at least temporarily, and represent something higher from which a distance has to be kept. Both are true. That's what the text is, is laying a program for. Okay, we'll pick it up again tomorrow.